my lower back stronger in 2020, starting right now. So in this video, I wanna show you three specific ways that you can do and that you can look for to help make your lower back stronger this year in 2020. First of all, I wanna say happy new year to all of you. It is January 1st, 2020, the start of a new year, the start of a new decade. For those of you that, uh, that are subscribers to my channel, thank you for coming on and for being subscribers. I appreciate you. And um, for those of you that are coming on for the first time on this channel, come and join us. I give a lot of tips on how to relieve chronic pain, solve chronic pain problems through different tips and strategies you can do at home, and then um, different things you can ask your doctor and therapist, and also introduce people to corrective care, chiropractic, which is what I do in my office. I've been a chiropractor now for 20 years. I just celebrated my 20th year anniversary just two weeks ago, so I'm excited about that. And what we do in our office is we apply and provide corrective chiropractic care methods to help people get through chronic spinal problems, things that cause conditions, uh, symptoms and pain from conditions such as L405 disc bulge, L5S1 disc bulge, sciatica, leg pain, postural distortions, scoliosis, very serious spinal conditions, and there's some very specific goals we have for our patients, and of course, is get them out of, out of their pain and suffering. That's number one. Number two, return them to a, a better, higher quality of life, and of course, help them avoid surgery, which is many people want. So if you've been struggling with chronic back pain, chronic leg pain, symptoms from things like L405 disc bulge or L5S1 disc bulge or sciatica or any conditions and symptoms related to the spine, whether it's your lower back, middle back, or even the neck, I want you to understand one thing for this year to make it a goal for you if you've had trouble finding a solution is to never give up. Never give up, never give up. If you wanna solve your problem naturally with conservative methods, there are ways you can do that. And maybe chiropractic is something that you could investigate if you have access to it. I'm not sure which part of the world you're in, but if you're watching now, let me know in the comment section. And I will take uh, questions and answers um, uh, live during this uh, live uh, video because it is coming out live to you right now. So there's the comment uh, um, section open up, the chat box is open up. But I want you to understand that everyone goes through health tr uh, struggles, uh, especially when it comes to chronic back problems. And one of the biggest things I've seen in my office lately is that a lot of people have tried many, many other things that just haven't worked for them. They've kind of been misled. So if that's you, I want you to understand that it's not your fault. I know that you do the best you can to solve your chronic back problem or ailments, but uh, unfortunately, um, if you haven't had a proper assessment done, and it's not your fault because you're not the professional, it's the doctors that have to do this for you, if they haven't discovered a true s a spinal condition and a spinal problem, then you can never find the right solution. So that's what we aim to do in our offices to start off with a proper examination and assessment, x-ray analysis, case review with all the other reports, and then uh, that will help dictate the course of care that we provide. So never ever give up, keep searching. And if you're looking for help and guidance, let me know, comment below, comment in the chat box. If you're looking for a chiropractic referral somewhere in your city, I'll do my best to help you with that as well. I wanna share with you a story uh, before I go on to these three tips. And this here, I'm running low on my battery, so I'm gonna do the best I can. Um, so uh, this story here, this lady came into my office, um, it was la last year, so 2019, and uh, she's had uh, chronic lower back problems and hip pain. And we took, uh, we did an assessment and we did um, uh, an examination of her spine and her posture. And when I looked at her x-rays, man, I was just shaking my head and, and she was concerned as well because, you know, if I look, I'm not gonna show you the x-ray obviously, but I'm gonna show you what a model looks like. So a spinal model. If we look at the lumbar spine, okay? So the lumbar spine should be straight up and down. So each one of these are vertebra, okay? In between are the discs. From here, these are the nerves that come out from these openings here, okay? And if you've had an MRI report that said neural foraminal encroachment or impingement, this opening here, where this, this opening here where this nerve comes out, that's called a foramen or a neural foramen. And if a disc bulges, it will irritate that nerve over there. So that's what they're talking about. Anyway, so the spine should be straight from the front, have a natural lateral, elliptical curve from the lateral side. 
And if you look at the whole spine, okay, here's a, a miniature model, but if you look at the whole spine, it should be straight like an arrow from the front and have these curves from the side. So this lady's spine, so I'll show you from the backside, she had a nasty curve, okay? So it was curving sideways like that in the lumbar spine and a serious pelvic tilt. And that's what her x-ray showed. She had a very, very serious scoliosis in the lower part over here. And not only that, she, you know, being in her, in her 60s, she had lots of degeneration in those lumbar vertebra. You can imagine that if the spine should be straight and has this natural curve from the side, but if it's bending, right, if it's bending, it's going to degenerate the discs on the lateral side and degenerate the joints. Eventually, it will go from looking something like this. So this would be normal, okay, normal, normal, and this would be degenerated. And I show these models often because it's really important to know what that looks like. You'll see as well the opening of the nerves. So again, nice and open neural foramen, spinal nerves, and then closed. So she had very significant spinal degeneration. And because it was a degenerated scoliosis, it was a very, very serious and complicated case. And not only that, she did also say that her um, overall, she was um, t tired more often. Um, her back felt weaker. And she also had this very significant postural shift. So your head, posturally, your head should be over your sternum and pubic bone. And she was shifted to one side and tilted to another side. Of course, the spinal scoliosis dictated part of that postural problem as well. So what we did was um, these three things that I'm going to tell you about today. Now, uh, they, they, may, they may seem very general and very simplified when I describe them to you. I can tell you they are life changing, okay, if you seek them out. So it, I, get, I, I proceeded with these three methodologies and today she's happier, she's walking better, she, um, she tells me every single time she's stronger with her back, even with the structural distortion, that underlying structural distortion, which is a permanent problem in her case because of all the degeneration, because of all that degeneration, she still feels stronger, she's working part-time, uh, and she's doing something that she uh, enjoys to do, and she's, she's doing this with no chronic back pain, no back pain whatsoever, and more mobility and more lower back strength. And that's what I want for you as well. So that's what the purpose of this video is for. I'm gonna get into these, um, these tips right now in a moment. So I said three tips, right? So how to make your lower back stronger, I'm gonna give you three tips, but I do want you to watch to the end because I'm gonna give you a fourth bonus thing to do that's often missed by many rehabilitation specialists, doctors, maybe even chiropractors or physiotherapists. Very, very important. So three things plus one bonus to make a four, okay? So why is it important to make your back stronger? This is the purpose. So why is it important? It's because, number one, if you're already healthy and strong and fit and fairly in good posture and have no back issues, if that's you, well, it's important because it helps you to prevent back injuries at any time in the future. The stronger your back is, the more likely you're gonna prevent a back injury in the future. I'm not sure if you knew this, but did you know that 80% of people, so 80% of the population, that's eight out of 10, at some point in their life, will actually have some sort of back pain at some point in their life. So the prevalence of lower back pain is very, very high in the human population. In fact, it's been often said that it's one of the most common things that brings someone to a medical doctor's office next to the common cold. So at some point, someone will have low back pain at some point in their lives. It doesn't have to be like that, but that's how common it is. So if you're already doing all right and you're okay and you feel pretty good and quote unquote, everything's great and normal, then these, these things will still help you to prevent back problems and injuries in the future. Now, number two, why the purpose for this is if you're currently having a back problem, whether it's a chronic back problem, acute back, back problem, and you've had a back injury and possibly degeneration, well, these things will help you to get back on a road to recovery a lot sooner, help you to rehabilitate the lower back and the injury, get you to return back to normal activities of your daily living. What does that mean? It means things that you want to do, whether it's walking, whether it's playing with your kids and family, whether it's doing sports, whether it's just being able to do your work properly, um, sitting at a desk, driving, sleeping. These are all important things that uh, are important for um, act our activities of daily living and of course to prevent recurrence. I can't tell you how, how much uh, people, I see them come to my office with chronic back problems. 
there is an emotional component to that. There's a fear that this injury may never get better. And there's a fear that it may come back in the future if it does. So we want to prevent that. So these th three things are important, okay? So are you ready? If you're ready, let me know. Let me know, give me a thumbs up in the chat box if you wanna hear these, because I will get into it right now. And if you're excited about this, please let me know as well. Give me some feedback. I, I, I thrive off the feedback, and I see there's a bunch of comments already in the comment section, which I'll get to in a moment. Thank you, Emon, for the thumbs up. Appreciate it. So these are the three ways, okay? Now, number one, I cannot stress how important it is to get a proper spinal assessment by a chiropractor, and also if there's a structural distortion of the spine to get that corrected with chiropractic adjustments, okay? So let me explain again. So then this is co commonly missed by many, many people. The spine has a certain alignment, should be straight from the front and have natural curves from the side. So this is only the lumbar spine. When there's a distortion, a shift, right? If that's temporary and it, it goes back to center, that's okay. But if that becomes permanent and chronic, then that's a problem. And that will cause four main structures of the spine to be distorted, which disrupts the uh, spinal biomechanics and neurology. Okay, I'm not gonna get too detailed, but I just wanna kind of show you what I'm talking about, okay? So I got a bunch of models here I'm gonna share with you. So four structures get distorted when there's sp uh, structural distortions of the spine. So we have discs, we have bones, muscles, nerves. So let me show you here, okay. When there's a distortion, the spine is now tilted to this side, okay? Number one, and it's no particular order, I'm just gonna number, number them. One, the disc gets distorted. The disc gets distorted, okay? So when a disc gets distorted, that triggers an inflammatory response. Inflammation, there's a lot of things that happen. One of the things that happen is there's a release of chemical irritants, things like bradykinin and uh, lactic acid, but bradykinin, kind of things that are irritating to the spinal tissues, and that will trigger a massive pain response. Number two, the joint capsule, which are the ligaments back here, they get disrupted also. They're, they are, um, uh, when they're injured, they produce inflammation, okay? Number three, the muscles get stretched, okay? The muscles get stretched on the spine, and the tendons where the muscles attach to get stretched on the spine as well. Now, muscles and tendons tell the, the brain what position the spine should be in, now, when those get distorted, there's a distortion of information from brain to spine, spine to brain. So brain to body, body to brain. Now, posture gets disrupted and shifted to compensate for this abnormal shift. So when this because, becomes chronic and doesn't get corrected, scar tissue begins to develop on the joints. Discs begin to degenerate over time, gets into something like that. The only thing that I know with conservative methods to correct this are specific chiropractic adjustments by a chiropractor. So we need to correct it and correct it and correct it and correct it over and over as long as necessary to improve the biomechanical st structure of that vertebra and those joints, okay? To, in, in doing so now, there's better mobility and functionality in the spine, right? It's moving properly the way it should, should be moving. Now, there's no need for inflammation to accumulate on the discs and joints. The muscles and tendons are now giving proper information to the brain about position. Posture begins to reset. St stress response begins to decrease. Inflammation decreases. Pain decreases. Mobility improves. And people feel better. That's the basic premise of chiropractic. There's a neurologic a component and a biomechanical component. Okay? So that's very important. And the only, the only um, profession that I know that is, that is focused specifically on looking for structural distortions or misalignments of the spine and correcting them is chiropractic. Now what we do in our office, we take it to the next level and we begin to apply corrective methods. So when there's adjustments to the spine by a chiropractor, local areas, that's called a segmental adjustment, so a local area. But what we do also is we work on global areas. So here's a global spinal model. Should be elliptical from the side, straight from the front. Let's say this person lost their elliptical curve. They're doing that. You can see already how there's this compression occurring here. There's now a straightened lumbar spine. It's known in literature that if the lumbar spine loses its curve, then it's highly probable that it will correlate with pain response. So we, we, what we do is we look at this, we assess it through spinal assessments, 
measure the angles, and then determine where the person is when they start with, and then we put them on different traction blocks and traction setups to help reset that alignment back into that normal curve. So that's called corrective chiropractic care. There's traction that's involved with that. There's postural adjustments as well, global body postural adjustments, and then postural exercises. So that's what corrective chiropractic methods do. So that's number one, one way. And why do I say that that helps get the back stronger? Well, first of all, when there's inflammation on spinal tissues um, or any joint, as a matter of fact, because it triggers a pain response, pain automatically inhibits muscular function. So if muscular function is inhibited, how the heck can you have up a proper full strength of those muscle tissues? If you have chronic inflammation in the lower back and it's never been corrected, how could it ever get stronger? And the, one of the biggest mistakes, which I talked about in my last live video, frequently asked question uh, video, is don't ever rehabilitate a spine that's structurally out of alignment. First, first get the structural alignment corrected chiropractically, and then work on the rehabilitative exercises later on, which I'll talk about in a moment. So that's why it's important to get the spine structurally corrected. Now, different people are from different parts of the world. So I'd like to know where you're from. Uh, so comment in the chat box. I, I'm really interested to know where people are tuning in from. And uh, if you're watching this later on, comment below in the comment section. If you're looking for um, a chiropractic referral, um, if you're in Canada or United States, I, I'm located in Canada. My office is in Vaughan, Ontario, which is just north of Toronto. And um, there are a lot of chiropractors in, the, in this area that I know of, um, but we're located in Vaughan. Um, hi, Paulette from Chicago. <laughs> and, uh, but if you're in, in the Canada, United States, I have a network of chiropractors that I can tap into and help you find a chiropractor in your area, or I can direct you to a directory that I belong to also. Uh, and I get nothing out of this, okay? This is me purely just helping you out. I like to like, get nothing out of this besides feeling good about helping you. Uh, if you're in places like um, UK, I uh, may be able to help uh, find your referral in the London area. Um, other parts of the world, unfortunately, um, chiropractic is not as prevalent, um, you know, like uh, India and Pakistan, and there's a few chiropractors out there, uh, but there are a lot of chiropractors out in Australia and, um, and New Zealand as well. So if you're in different parts of the world, I'll do my best to help um, give you a referral uh, of someone that I think will be uh, great, okay? So that's, that's number one. So two more plus a bonus, okay? And if you're enjoying this, let me know. Um, I can see your, your chat uh, comments here in the chat box. Give me some thumbs up. Um, let me know if you're enjoying this, if you find value out of this, um, because if you do, I'll continue. Okay. If you don't, that's okay too. Uh, I, I like to find ways to improve on this. Um, and if you're wondering where I'm broadcasting from, I'm literally broadcasting, um, in my, from my home, uh, my daughter's sleeping in the other room. So I have to be really quiet. And, uh, although I like get excited, so it's hard for me to be quiet, but, uh, right now I'm on holiday break, but it's just hard for me to take a holiday break. Um, when I know that there's people out there that need this information. So I just try to make these videos um, even from home because um, I know they're helpful. So number two, after the chiropractic adjustments and corrections of the spine, then you can start getting, uh, or even concurrently, start getting into stretching and mobility, okay? Stretching mobility. So when it comes to the lower back, some key things you want to look at to stretch. Um, the, the lower back muscle gluteal areas with knee to chest stretches, those are very helpful. Uh, piriformis muscle. Piriformis muscle is, are uh, two muscles on either side in the gluteal area, and um, they, they're in and around the sciatic nerve. So if they're really tight, can trigger sciatic pain down the leg. That's important. The quadricep muscles. So so the front thigh muscles should be stretched as well, as well as the hamstring muscles on the back side of your thigh. Why is that important? Do I have a pelvis here? Let me show you. So I'm not going to have I don't have a full um, uh, model of, of the legs, but the quadricep muscles attach from the pelvis to the knee, okay? And then the hamstring muscles attach from the pelvis on the backside to below the knee as well. So if the hamstring muscles are tight, then they will distort the pelvic structures and the sacrum over here. If the quad muscles are tight, they'll distort the pelvic stru structures as well, as well. So they're all connected. So if there's a, a distortion in the pelvis and the sacrum, it will cause distortion over here as well. So you need to get this corrected chiropractically, get this corrected, so lumbar, sacrum, pelvis corrected chiropractically, and then work on stretching the hamstring muscles, quad muscles, piriformis, and of course, lower back muscles. So those are key stretches that I highly recommend. 
And um, what I'm going to do in, so I talked about the referrals. You let me know in the comments if you want uh, help me to help you find a referral somewhere that you're at. Um, for this section, part two, um, I do have other videos on my channel on stretching for sciatica, stretching for piriformis, um, mobility, um, different stretches. And I'm going to keep adding more and more as I go along. So there, there's a few that are linked in the description below. So be sure to look at that, okay? So then there's mobilization. All right, we got someone from my local area, Brampton, Ontario, and I'm up in Vaughan. Hi, Kunal. Nice to see you on here. That's awesome. So uh, number two is uh, mo uh, part of this is mobilization. So mobilization is very, very important. So when there's, when there's, so check this out. When there's a chronic back problem, so here's a segment. Chronic degeneration. Unfortunately, it's permanent, irreversible, irreversible arthritic damage. This now is a less mobile spinal segment. Less mobility leads to more degeneration and more back problems in the future. So and you need to increase the mobility of the spine. Even if it's degenerated, you need to work on the mobility, okay? One way to help with that is chiropractic adjustments, for sure. Okay, I know that for sure because you break down adhesions and you're improving the structural integrity and mobility of the spine, okay? Now, the other thing is to start doing some mobility work. So two of my favorite exercises for mobility is Mad Cow, or um, um, angry cat, um, um, uh, mad cat, I mean, I should say, mad cat or angry cat stretch. It's uh, kind of like that yoga mobility. So you're on, you're on your hands and knees and you arch your back and drop your back and it gives you a full spine mobility. And if you add pelvic tilt in there, you'll also get some mobility in the lumbar spine. So it's very, very key. And I have that in one of my videos as well in the, um, in the description below. And then uh, the other one that I really, really like is pelvic tilts. Okay, so you can do seated pelvic tilts. Again, I have a description of that in, um, I have a video of that in my description below. Very, very important. So what they do is, is the pelvic tilts help to get mobility in the pelvis, in the sacrum over here, the sacral base, and the lumbar spine. So you're getting mobility in there, okay? Also, one of the problems, like I said earlier, with chronic degenerative back problems is there's a lack of mobility and a lack of coordination and control, fine motor control. So if you start adding this mobility exercise in there, you will begin to improve the coordination of the lower back, getting full activation of those muscles. Same with the stretching. When you're beginning to be more flexible, you're getting full activation of those muscles, which means now you have an ability to get stronger with those muscles because you're using full activation of those muscles, okay? So stretching, quads, hamstrings, piriformis, lower back, gluteal muscles, and then mobility work. Very, very important. That's number two, okay? Cool. If you guys are liking this, let me know. I'm going to move on to number three. Number three. Okay. So number three, and I've talked about this a lot in my previous videos is, oh, let me go back to number two. I have a whole video on, on seven mobility exercises you should do. They're not all spinal mobility, but they're full body mobility exercises. So catch that in the description below as well. So number three, number three is core strengthening. Okay. Core strengthening. This is when I start to introduce core strengthening for the lower back. First, we do start with the posture, structural corrections of the spine, chiropractically. Then we get into stretching mobility. And then I start getting into the core strengthening. N don't do it backwards. Trust me, it's, it, it doesn't work as well, okay? The sequence like this is much better in my opinion and in my experience. And like I said in the story earlier in that case uh, with that lady that came in with the chronic degenerative scoliosis and chronic back pain, which is exactly what we did, the sequence. And within three months, she's got her, her, her life back and she's feeling stronger with her back and more mobile. So core strengthening exercises, they're gonna strengthen the abdominal muscles, the lower back stabilizers, and also the glutes, okay? The glutes are very important, the gluteal muscles or buttocks. When there's a, when there's a back injury again, okay? We, talk, we talked about that, chronic degeneration or back injury inflammation, it inhibits a muscular activation. So muscles are, are inhibited and the spine, be, the muscles become weaker, and back becomes weaker. So core strengthening will help you to not only strengthen the big muscles like your back, like your uh, paraspinal muscles in the back and the abdominal muscles in the, in the front of your abdomen and then the gluteal muscles, but also the key stabilizing muscles of the lower back, okay? So if we look over here, there's, there, and you're not gonna see them here, but I'm gonna show you. So there's muscles that attach to each segment of, the, of, the, of these transverse processes. Each segment of, um, they go from one to another, then one to another. There's a bunch of little muscles. They're all stabilizers. They're all erector spinal stabilizers of the back that, that are very delicate and very small 
and when the back is injured, they get inhibited and they lose coordination. So when you are stretching the, 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 your, your, your muscles out and you're um, getting mobility and chiropractic adjustments, you, after that, you need to start to support the st stabilizers with core strengthening exercises. And I created a whole video that, that shows you seven great core exercises for the lower back. They're in the description below. Make sure you check that out as well, okay? Because people ask me about these exercises. So I make these videos because people ask me about them. So it's very, very important to the core strengthening exercises. All right, we got someone from Boston, Massachusetts. Thanks for coming on. I love it, All right? And we got people from India as well on here as well. Great. So I'll get to your questions in a moment um, on the live chat. So uh, I'm going to keep going uh, another few minutes longer. So make sure you get your questions in. Now, so we talked about the three things. Number one, chiropractic, spinal corrections, and postural corrections. Number two, flexibility or stretching and mobility. Over here, number two, one, two. And number three, the core strengthening, stabilize, stabilization of the lumbar spine and the stabilizer muscles, okay? Now, what is the bonus number four? Often, often missed, very, very important, is what I call balance exercises or proprioception exercises. What the heck does that mean, okay? Um, let me try to simplify this as much as possible. In our, in our body, we have a bunch of senses, right? Like vision and hearing and taste and touch, right? And, uh, and uh, you know, these are, these are kind of external um, um, senses. We also have internal senses, okay? And one very important internal sense is called proprioception. Proprioception, all that means is joint position sense. So that, what that means is that I can blindfold you like this, okay? Close your eyes, put a blindfold on. I can take your hand, put it up like this above you and ask you, where is your hand in relationship to your body? And you'll say it's above my shoulder to the front and to the right. That your brain knows wh where your body is positioned in space because of these joint receptors. They're joint position receptors that are called proprioceptors, okay? They're super, super important for you to maintain proper upright posture, balance, coordination. And oftentimes when there's an injury, these receptors, these proprioceptors get disrupted and there's kind of a mismatch of information from brain to joints and then joints to brain. You may, you may, you may have seen this yourself if you have a chronic back problem. One of the most common things people tell me is they tell me that, um, they tell me that, that I lack, I, I don't feel as balanced anymore. I feel like I'm wobbling to one side. If I close my eyes, I tip, I I tip over more, more quickly. Uh, I feel out of balance, I feel imbalanced. People tell me these things on a regular basis. And what that tells me is that the proprioceptive system is disrupted. Another example I can give you is, Elaine says that's true. And, and yes, I, I agree with you because I see this all the time. And it's often missed, Elaine. It's often missed, I tell you. Like, people come to my office with these chronic problems. They've been to so many other places, um, other professional offices, and a lot of these things have been missed. Another example I can show you, uh, I can describe this to you, is if you've ever had an ankle sprain, okay? If you play sports and you sprain your ankle, basketball, soccer, whatever it is, sprinting, or you're just walking down the street and you miss the step or the curb and you sprain your ankle, all right? So let's say that ankle never got properly rehabilitated. So what I mean by that is um, um, get rid of the inflammation, um, improve mobility and function and strength, okay? Most people do that, but the last thing that's missed is balance exercises right? That ankle is more likely to be sprained in the future. So it has recurrent ankle sprains. So up to 90% more likely to be re-sprained in the future if you didn't correct the actual balance mechanisms, right? So if you've had an ankle sprain, check this out yourself. Let's say you sprained the right ankle, but not the left. So the left one is a good one and the right one was the bad one from the past. There's no current pain whatsoever. Do a single leg stance on the right ankle and see if you stand up upright or wobbly and shaky and then compare and do a single leg stance to the left ankle with a good one and see if you're more sturdy and you'll see that you are more sturdy. That's a disruption of those proprioceptors or joint position sensors, okay? The same thing happens in lumbar, whoops, lumbar spinal problems. So the spine is full of receptors. There's a ton of receptors in the sacral region over here and then a ton of receptors up in the neck area, but also the rest of the spine. So when the spine is disrupted, out of position, distorted, inflammation in the discs, inflammation on on the, on the uh, uh, joints, um, tight muscles, disruption of mobility and coordination and balance. Well, those receptors are disrupted. So they need to be retrained. So you retrain them by, like I talked about earlier, those three things. Number one, 
structural corrections of the spine to improve the alignment and biomechanics and functionality of the spine. Number two, flexibility and mobility. Number three, core strengthening of the stabilizers and back muscles. And then the fourth thing is balance exercises or proprioception exercises. So I'm gonna give you a couple that you can do. Now, I don't have any video instructions on this, but I will put them up pretty soon. I'll make a video on these balance exercises. So look out for it in the next one to two weeks. It will get out there soon. So one thing you can do is called a single leg stance. You put you stand on one foot and you lift your knee off the other and it's best to do it without shoes, okay? So with socks or barefoot, all right? So stand on one foot, lift the, leg, the other foot off the ground, okay? and then you try to balance on one foot and hold that balance for 30 seconds, 60 seconds without wobbling. Now, if you can do, let's say 15 good seconds and then you begin to wobble at the 20th second because you can time this, then you know your benchmark right now is 15. Then you try to get to 30 without wobbling. When you can do 30, then you try to get to 45 seconds without wobbling. When you can do 45, then you get to up to um, uh, 60 seconds and you're gonna retrain your proprioception balance systems pretty quickly within a matter of days and weeks You'll actually know that you're gonna be improving. Okay, and and always do both sides So right foot and left foot single leg stance So and try to hold it up up to like a minute or even two minutes if you can without toppling over or, or um, losing your balance and one gentleman um, uh, over a year ago with a, a serious disc problem in his back and uh, very a lot of pain in his lower back and his leg we got him through the inflammatory uh, stage, got rid of his pain, got his balance improved and his posture improved. And then started doing this balance exercises. Um, so he got his posture improved and his spine improved, uh, spinal alignment improved. But we got him doing these balance exercises where he's doing a single leg stance. He couldn't even hold a single leg stance for two seconds before toppling over. By the time we were done with him, within several months, he got back to holding it up to at least a minute on each leg. So it's very, very trainable. Okay, so single leg stance is important. Next one is heel to toe walking, okay? We test this every time with our patients in the initial examination, and most people fail this test. So you're, you're walking, so I'm gonna use my hands as an example because I'm sitting down. So you're walking on a straight line, touch heel to toe, okay? So foot and then foot in front and in front on a straight line on the, on the ground. That's called heel to toe walking or tandem walking. Most people can literally do it with their eyes open because eyes are, are, are also uh, responsible for proprioception and joint position sense. Some people do fail it with their eyes open, okay? Uh, most people have trouble doing it backwards, and then almost every single person I test in my office has trouble doing five feet single um, heel-toe walking, single line heel-toe walking with their eyes closed. Because when you take out vision, the, um, other than your vestibular mechanism, which is a lower priority balance uh, uh, mechanism in your body, the highest priority is joint position sense. So you take all vision, low priority on the balance mechanisms of the ear. Now, you're, now your brain is only uh, depending on the proprioception joint position sensors, and that's a good way to test them. So single leg uh, stance, and then the next thing is tandem walking or heel toe walking to retrain it. And you, again, you, you start with five feet, maybe go to 10 feet eventually, and you do, the, the, uh, do it for like a two or three reps back and forth. So you go one way and then another way, and you do it every single day and you'll see within weeks, you're gonna improve your heel toe walking. It's very, very important, okay? Um, and then eventually you can start doing it with your eyes closed and eventually backwards, eyes open. And if you can, backwards, eyes closed. Very, very good way to improve proprioception. The last one when it comes to balance in this bonus section is a wobble board. You may have seen it at the gym or you may have seen it um, um, in physio offices or chiropractic offices is uh, there's a, a kind of a square board Okay, I have a card here. So there's a, a square board and then underneath there's kind of like, you know, a, wob a, a, a stick or a ball and you wobble on it. So you stand and you're wobbling on it. Sometimes it wobbles all four. Sometimes it just rocks back and forth. And it's an unlevel, imbalanced surface, which is great to retrain. You'll find that when you're standing on that, you're going to tip to one side first. So let's say over here, let's use this. Okay, so, so you see that? So you're going to tip to one side first but the goal is to, is to balance, okay? Balance without having the board touch the ground. So it's more advanced work, okay? And this is a very, very great way to improve balance, coordination, and proprioception. Um, and, and in doing so, helps to strengthen your overall spinal condition and back, okay? So very, very important. Those are just some simple ways to improve uh, proprioception and balance, okay? So just to recap, number one, chiropractic spinal adjustments, correction of the spinal distortions, and posture. Number two, stretching and mobility. 
right? We talked about that. Number three, core strengthening. And then number four, which is the bonus, is balance and proprioception retraining, okay? And they gotta be done in a certain order, okay? Very, very important, okay? All right, if you guys like this, there's about 34 minutes into it, which is pretty cool. I, and I'm really um, going long because I'm getting feedback from the comments that you're liking this. So if you like this, throw some thumbs up. Make sure you hit the blue thumb thumbs up button as well at the bottom. And um, let me know where you're from. Uh, I really like to hear that. And uh, Elaine says, that's true. Well, thank you, Elaine. <laughs> we talked about that earlier and you said it all makes sense. And yes, it does make sense. And, and I'm glad you, you agree. So let me go over some questions here. I'm going to just go up at the top of the chat box. And uh, now um, just understand that I cannot give specific um, advice. I, I haven't met you, uh, you know, in person. I haven't done a physical examination assessment. So I'm going to answer in generalities. I hope you can appreciate that. People ask me all the time, what should I do? Should I do this? And then should I do that? So I can only really give kind of general guidelines and help you uh, discuss certain things with your uh, practitioner. All right, we got someone from Korea. That's awesome. So, Min Chang, thank you, Min Chang, for joining uh, joining us. So I can only really give um, um, generalities, but this will still help you either to take a certain action right now on your own, or to at least discuss it with your practitioner. Okay. So if that's okay with you, then I'll proceed. Let me know if that's okay. <laughs> Happy New Year, by the way, 2020. It's going to be a great year. And if you're coming on now, whether it's on the live or uh, on the repeat later on, make 2020 the best year that you can. The past is in the past. You cannot change it, whether it's, whether it's um, health issues, whether it's relationship issues, financial issues. You can change your life when you want it and if you want it that bad by making the right choices to lead you in the right direction, okay? So just keep that in mind. We've all been through our struggles, including myself. I've been through my struggles as well. Um, and you know, I keep them to myself most of the time and I journal them out, but I can tell you that if you keep seeking for answers, you will find the answer. So if I can help you in any way, you let me know. All right. Okay, someone asked here at the very beginning of the chat. So um, I think it's Yolanda, Yolanda90 with a J says, will I, will I ever get better? The orthopedic told me I would never run again or ride a roller coaster. And I'm really, I'm really sorry to hear that that was a message you were giving, you were given. Um, I wish that you, I wish for you that you, you regain your health and get better. I just don't know your particular situation. I'm back. Oh wow, the excitement. If you're still there, let me know. I'm sorry about that. These things happen, it's live uh, technology and uh, let me just type in here. I wanted, I do want to finish the broadcast. Uh, I know I lost some viewers, but um, for those of you who are still here, thank you. But I do want to finish. I want to go over the questions. Uh, whenever you're doing something live, these technicals, technical problems happen. But I'm, I'm just sure glad that I was able to plug the power back in and get you back on. So thank you, thank you, thank you for sticking around. So let me go back to what I was talking about. And I am plugged in with power, so it's not going to happen again. Um, and if you can hear me, give me some thumbs up in the chat box. Let me know that you can hear me, okay? Because I want to make sure uh, I don't have my earpiece in right now. I want to make sure that, that you're still good. So let me know if you can hear me. Please do that now. All right, we got some people back. I appreciate it. So going back to Yolanda, I think she messaged, messaged again. Let me just find that. We'll get to some more question and answers. Okay. Hi there. Thank you. I'm glad you can hear me. Thank you. Okay. So, um, here's, um, so will I get better? So here's the situation. I was hit by a car, um, last year in, uh, in January. Oh, you know, just three weeks ago, started to experience L4, L5 discomfort, cannot walk for a long period of time, can't sleep without painkillers. That's unfortunate. Um, you know, there's always uh, adverse reactions when it comes to medicines and most people want to avoid that. So please help. Um, yes, it goes to my toe. Is it called sciatica? So as I said earlier, I, I can't diagnose um, through uh, remotely through video, but it does require an assessment. Do get that assessed, Yolanda. Very, very important. Um, whenever uh, pain, whenever symptoms uh, progress into the extremities or into the, the feet or toes in this case, it's a progressive problem. It's getting worse. So it needs to be addressed properly and it needs to be assessed properly. It may be sciatica, it may not, it could be a disc problem. I just don't know without a full assessment, but definitely, definitely get that checked, okay? Next one is Pradeep. Pradeep, 
I've been suffering fr uh, from sciatica. Does it go? Um, uh, does it go to the toes? I get frequent toe cramps in left muscle stiffness. In, in left muscle stiffness. So um, leg pain, toe cramps, and st muscle stiffness. So the sciatic nerve emerges from the lower, um, from the gluteal area, and the actual, the actual lumbar spine nerves, the lower lumbar spine, L405, and the sacral nerves form the sciatic nerve that comes out of the gluteal buttock area. And then the nerve uh, in, the, in the thigh, the, the back of the thigh is the sciatic nerve and then branches out into the leg. And then from the leg branches out even more and goes into the toes. So if there are toe symptoms, it is possible it could be related to either the uh, sciatic nerve um, in the gluteal area, or it can be related to the lower lumbar nerves over here, or it can be related to the lower leg nerves as well. So a proper assessment will rule um, out the problem and discover what the actual problem is. So I uh, hope that helps there, Pradeep, okay? All right, and again, sciatica. So Yolanda asks, is it, is it called sciatica? So generally speaking, and we just talked about that, when the sciatic nerve is disrupted or irritated in the gluteal area where the piriformis is, that's true sciatic pain because the, the problem's coming from the sciatic nerve. When it's nerve pain coming from the lower lumbar area over here, these nerves over here, that can trigger leg pain as well. Well, it's not technically sciatica, but it's like sciatic-like pain or leg pain that's triggered from the lower lumbar nerves. All right, what else we have here? Okay, so Muhammad, he says, annular tear with bulge, L405, and S1 complex, annular tear involving the outermost fibers of L405, S1, it looks like an MRI report, disc centrally teared, located and innervated area of the annulus, annu um, annulus annular. So. These are, are common descriptions that are used in MRI reports and I read them all day long in my office. People bring them in, in to me during their case review and consultation. So um, there's obviously a, a lot of um, disruptions in, in those lumbar discs. And just so I can show you, where's my annular tear over here? So if you look over here, so normal disc, normal disc, annular fibers you can see the rings okay so see the rings annular fibers and then this jelly material is the nucleus pulposus so when these get disrupted they're called annular tears okay so this is what it looks like over here so you see the rings you see how this got disrupted here i can lift it up okay so that got disrupted it's an annular tear over here there had to be an annular tear for that nucleus to actually emerge and over here is beginning to bulge out mildly it's not full yet okay eventually when it's full it goes into like that so see the bulge there okay so again we talked about this earlier and earlier in, the, in this video all those situations are um, results of something biomechanically or structurally disrupted uh, on the spine and and this tissues uh, um, that caused it so the goal is not to so much fix the annular tears or the disc bulge, but to correct the structural distortion of the spine that led to the disc bulge, get that aligned better, and reduce the insult and irritation on the discs. Okay, so that's very, very important, okay? Okay, Paulette, what tests can I take to find out if I have inflammation? So that's a very uh, broad question, Paulette. It's a good question, very broad. And um, when it comes to local local inflammation so if there's inflamed joints or inflamed discs when it comes to local inflammation i don't know any spe specific tests for that but there are blood work tests for systemic inflammation in the body and uh, then the question would be is why is there systemic inflammation so these are things that need to be done with your medical doctor um, so blood tests may be something that that you could look into Okay, we got uh, Paulette from Chicago, and uh, I, I love Chicago, by the way. If you're still on Paulette, I'm not sure if you're still on. Uh, I actually went to school in Chicagoland, so um, my chiropractic college um, is National College of Chiropractic, and I graduated in 1999, that's 20 years ago, so I know uh, Chicago very, very well. Uh, and um, I brought my girlfriend there, and I even proposed to her in Chicago. That's how much I love the city. So uh, it's a great city, I love Chicago so much. We have uh, a few other people here. Okay, someone asked, is there a chiropractor in uh, Hyber, um, Hyderabad, India? So I'm not very familiar with the Indian um, uh, area, so uh, the country of India, but I do know there are some specific chiropractors in some of the bigger cities 
if that works for you. I hope that does. Uh, someone's from Boston, great city. I want to visit one day. Okay, Ahmed says I have a pinch of L, L of four and five, so I'm assuming L four and L five, and a severe calcification on the spine. If you can, uh, can you help me? Thank you in advance. So obviously, it's a very broad question. Can you help me? I wish I could. If you if you're here in my office, I will help you any way I can. But what's that calcification of the spine? And it could be. Let me get my electrical cord proper. Okay, so these bony spurs, these bony spurs here, okay, that's calcification deposits on the lumbar spine. So these are signs that this has been going on for a very, very long time. Very, very long time. So this is chronic degenerative change that occurred over probably 20 years in this example, maybe 30 years. This does not happen in a normal structural alignment situation. So again, degeneration, disc bulge, annular tears, calcifications, these are signs of, of, of adaptation, maladaptation to something that's been structurally distorted for a long, long time. So you need to discover the structural distortion of the spine, like I talked about earlier, step one, which is chiropractic assessment and uh, corrections of the spine, if there's a distortion there, because you want to, number one, number one is improve the structural alignment to reduce the pain and inflammation, and number two, improve mobility, and then number three, allow it to actually function properly for the future, okay, for your future life. So, so um, that's, what I, that's what the calcification is um, and disruption in that area. Okay, let's see. Someone here says, Denisio, I went for surgery and it, I'm still doing bad. Um, you know what? I, I totally like feel for that big time. There are uh, sometimes cases that require surgery. I have referred people for surgical consultations. I literally had um, uh, one person that came to my office, uh, found me online through one of my videos, came to my office, and he literally, I'm not kidding, literally crawled on all hands, uh, uh, hands and knees um, down the hallway of my office into the exam room because he could not move. So um, I, ha I, can only, I can only do a very limited examination because we couldn't do any mobility, um, range of motion, posture, spinal checks. So I did a few things and then he left and he went to the ER and I called him on Monday and he said he went through surgery. So that does happen. There are sometimes cases that are very, very extreme at the end, um, at the end of the situation, not at the beginning, that may require surgery. And uh, there's very, very little that I can do as a, as a chiropractor conservatively in those situations. So um, sometimes when the pain is so severe, when there's um, leg pain down both legs, when there's neurologic deficits in the legs or in the bladder or bowel, these are things that do require surgical consultations and a, a visit to the ER. Um, having said that, most disc bulge cases and low back cases don't require surgery, so conservative management is highly recommended at the beginning. And then the last thing I wanna say is that even when the surgery goes well, when the surgeon did their job properly, exactly the way it should have been, textbook, everything's great. Unfortunately, these uh, surgical cases for the back, the actual pain reoccurs in the future. Okay? It's been called in the past uh, failed back, um, back surgery syndrome. I don't think they call that anymore because it's not like the surgery went bad. It's just that it's such a complicated situation that it, it, it cannot fix the problem all the time and the scar tissue that's developed and the healing process required later on, that there's so much complex things that can actually go wrong in the spine, even later on, that the back pain may reoccur. So that's very, very fortunate. Um, I always advocate for, for um, conservative management of back issues before surgery and surgery as last resort. And most people agree with that that come to my office because most people want to prevent surgery. Okay, we have Sharmila. Uh, hello, Dr. Walter. Thanks for your guidance and I appreciate that. Uh, great work from you. Help us all to have a pain-free spinal health, and that's what I plan to do. So keep um, keep uh, to this uh, channel um, in the future because that's what I plan to do. Okay, so Sharmila also asked, what is this degeneration? Does it cause numbness in the leg? Great questions, and I, I think I've answered this over and over again. So normal disc, so from the side, nice and thick. Where's my pen? So nice and wide space, normal disc, normal disc. Nice annular Integrity, annular fiber, nucleus pulposus, well contained, no disruption on the nerves, no posterior disc bulges, very, very well contained disc, good spaces. That's a very, very normal disc. So disc degeneration is when there's disruptions, those annular tears, 
bulging, shrinking. See the space is down, so look at the difference. So the space is narrower, okay? That's disc degeneration. Sometimes the disc just dry out, called desiccation. Desiccation, if you see that on your MRI report, they dry it out. So they squish and dry out and it decreases mobility of the spine as well. So that's what disc degeneration is. And can it cause numbness in the legs? Sometimes it can, sometimes it doesn't. So we need to look at the, at, at the examination, x-rays, MRI results to kind of put it all together to see if it's related or not. But if you can imagine, so normal disc, nice and wide space, nice and wide. The nerve is free. It's not, look at this neural foramen over here is open, okay? Now, over here, this space is disrupted, okay? So even on this side with no disc bulge, the neural foramen is now narrower because this joint space is less. It's not as thick as this. So now it's probably half the size or, or maybe 80% um, less of this. So that means this nerve will be disrupted. So the nerve is not, in a, in a lumbar spine, the nerve is not just free like that. There's fat tissues in there, there's blood vessels in there. So there's very, um, it is a big space, but it's fully contained and fully covered, okay? So when there's a disc bulge, that's part, that's part of degeneration, that can irritate that nerve. If that nerve goes into your leg, then it can cause numbness tingling into the leg as well. So yes, it can be related, but not always. All right, all right. Mohammed, very informative session, sir. Thank you, sir, appreciate the feedback. Okay, what else we have here? And again, Happy New Year to everyone. It's January 1st, 2020. Make this year the best year you can. Okay, what about G-force sensitivity on the spine? R, Z, asked that. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. I'm not familiar with that. I'm gonna have to skip that question, I apologize. And uh, what else do we have here? Okay, we have, um, Utkarsh Raj, hello sir. My father is suffering from back pain. He couldn't uh, couldn't a uh, able to walk and stand right now. Also feeling in their legs and hip. What should I do? And then he has a follow up question. The MRI report says posterior bulge of L L405. Um, disc is causing mild indentation over thecal sac and compromising neural foramen bilateral. Wow, lots of words, and um, I'll explain what that means. Okay, so. Let's see here, this is the spinal model. So here is, is the spinal canal, okay? Inside here is the spinal canal, okay? So I put my pen inside the spinal canal from top to bottom. This would be something like the spinal cord, if you can see this tube over here. The spinal cord starts from the very top of the neck, so at the brainstem, brain, so brain, brainstem, spinal cord, goes all the way down to the lumbar spine, ends at about L1 or L2. So there is no spinal cord after L2. What happens inside the spinal canal after L2 is, the, uh, the spinal cord tapers into a very thin part, like almost like this pen, and then it branches out into a bunch of nerves. The nerves inside the, the lumbar spine in the lower back is called the cauda equina. Then those nerves, those spinal nerves then branch out from these nerves here and go to the organ systems of the uh, abdomen and pelvis, and the lower nerves and the sacral nerves go into the legs through the sciatic nerve. So, I have to kind of give you that preamble. Now, if there is, so let me show you this. This would be an example of the spinal canal and the spinal cord, okay, anywhere above L2, okay? If there is a posterior disc bulge, right, then that can affect the spinal cord anywhere above L2 and can, and can affect the tissues around the spinal cord. So it's not gonna show here, okay, let me see. I don't have it here either. But um, around the spinal cord is um, a material, it's called a fecal sac, which is made up of uh, strong membranes. And these membranes encase the, the brain and uh, they also encase the brainstem and spinal cord, right? So in the lower lumbar spine, okay? So there's a fecal sac on the inside, right? And then there are the spinal nerves on the inside. So sometimes the disc bulge will go posterior, which is back, okay? So we'll go posterior, which is back, and indent that fecal sac, okay? Now, in most cases, it's not gonna cause, it's not gonna cause a significant problem because there's so much space in there where those nerves are and um, it's not gonna actually impinge the nerve, okay? But if the disc bulge keeps going more and more posterior, more and more posterior, which is back, 
and it's really, really big and massive, it can actually compress those nerves and that would be a very serious situation, okay? And can cause things like cauticoina syndrome or deficit to the bladder, bowel, and um, loss of function in the legs, which you can't move and, and eventually shrinkage. It's just a, a bunch of neurologic problems which are not good, okay? So that's what uh, fecal sac indentation is. And I talked about neural foramina earlier. So from the side, this opening here, this open where the pen is, that's called the neural foramen. Foramen is Latin for window. Okay, foramen, window. So that's a window or opening in the canal and the spinal uh, column here and the nerve comes out. So when it's open and free and healthy, everything's good. And then when it's narrow, that's not good, okay? And then when the disc goes lateral, so see this disc goes lateral. So here's the front, here's, there's the back. This is lateral, which is side. That's called a posterior lateral disc bulge, which can occlude or disrupt the neural foramen and also that nerve there, okay? So uh, that's what that says there. So having said all that, um, I talked about this earlier in the video, so make sure you go back at the beginning, the three things. You wanna do some kind of chiropractic spinal corrections or some kind of structural correction of the spine to correct the underlying spinal problem, improve mobility, flexibility, and then do core strengthening and balance work. That's what I suggest that you do with your therapist, doctors uh, out there, okay? Okay, so how long will it take for treatment? So I'm assuming how long will it take to heal? It's a very, very good question. And it's dependent on person to person, case to case. So sometimes disc bulge uh, problems when they've been really chronic and there's lots of inflammation, scar tissue buildup, it can take you know literally like nine to 12 months to see some very significant improvements and corrections on the spine, posture, and overall function of, of the spine and overall um, quality of life. Um, there are cases that can be less than that, three to six months. It, it will not significantly improve on its own. Sometimes the pain may go away on its, own, on its own, but the actual whole structural integrity of the spine, the strength of the muscles, the balance is not gonna improve on its own. So it does need some professional work. So those three steps plus the fourth, the bonus that I showed earlier, um, that I talked about earlier in the video, make sure you look at that. So chiropractic, flexibility, mobility, um, core strengthening and balance work are super important. Okay. Murray, Marianito, thank you for those uh, nice words. Thank you, uh, Doc, and God bless you, your family. Happy New Year, and same to you as well, and to all of you. Okay, Pradeep asks, does this bulge cure or herniated? Uh, does does it cure by itself? Very, very good question, and I've asked, I've answered this question in other videos of mine. Uh, so look out for them on my channel. I'll just kind of give you a brief uh, synopsis. Unfortunately, a disc bulge uh, is a uh, a permanent disruption or permanent um, damage to the disc and I don't talk in terms of cure or not cure uh, those, are not, those are not words that I use that's not the goal of my type of treatment and shouldn't be what you, shouldn't be the, the way to look at this the goal should always be to restore structural alignment and integrity of the spine and reduce the irritation and insult on on the disc so you want to correct the underlying structural problem that caused this bulge in the, in the first place that triggered the inflammatory response and the pain response in the first place once that's corrected the inflammation process begins to decrease, the pain decreases, functionality, mobility improves, and you're back, getting back to your regular activities. I've had many, many patients that have come in with chronic uh, disc problems, pain, inflammation, lack of mobility, poor posture, um, lack of function, disruption in their activities daily living, and we took them through the corrective process in our office, and then they've improved standing better, walking better, better posture, better mobility, better structural alignment, and um, however, if they go back and get a, a post MRI done, they still have the disc bulge there. So did it cure? Well, it's still there, right? The damage is still there. The disruption is still there, but the functionality of the spine was improved and the quality of life was improved. And that's the key, key goal. So, um, I don't talk in terms of cure or not cure because I can't answer that, but I do know that the, that the goal is to improve the structural integrity of the spine and reduce the pain inflammation and improve overall, overall quality of life and quality of health. Okay, we got over here. Um, okay, so we have uh, Utkarsh Raj. Thanks uh, for such initiative, sir. It really helps us and thank you in advance, sir, and I appreciate the kind words. When I hear this kind of feedback, it gets me wanting to do this more and more. If you like this live uh, uh, scenario, you let me know in the comments under the video, uh, if you like, uh, or also in the, in the live chat, because I will do more and more of this. I, I thrive on this stuff. 
I love to help you guys um, any way I can uh, through tips, advice, and strategies and introduction and explanations of corrective chiropractic um, care. All right, let's see what we have here. We have more questions. Um, okay, Pr uh, Pradeep um, asks over here, Pradeep Balash Andran, does autoimmune disease cause arthritis on disc issues? What cream or anti-inflammatory medicine do you suggest? Okay, so when it comes to medicines, I don't make any suggestions whatsoever. Uh, first of all, um, we can't. No doctor should suggest a treatment um, through this this medium. This is just kind of general information. So definitely look out at your doctor for any specific creams and medicines. Uh, number two, I am not a medical doctor, so I don't work with drugs. Um, I'm a chiropractor. Chiropractic is a drugless uh, profession. Um, so if that's required, you got to look into a medical doctor in your area for that kind of information. When it comes to autoimmune disease, can it cause arthritis? Very, very good question. And um, the answer is yes. There uh, is at least one that I know of and maybe two um, that come to mind. But they're not very common in terms of arthritis or arthritis, especially on the spine. Uh, I've been a chiropractor for 20 years and I've looked at thousands and thousands of spines on x-rays. And I've yet to see uh, one in, 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 uh, in my uh, experience that I've seen in my office uh, with any an autoimmune disease that, that have caused arthritis. So things like rheumatoid arthritis is a hereditary autoimmune disease. It's a systemic overall um, problem in the body. So it doesn't just affect the joints. It can affect other parts, other organs as well. And of course, that uh, uh, creates a systemic inflammatory process all over the body, including the spine. And lupus also is a systemic inflammatory uh, autoimmune disease as well that's hereditary and also can affect the spine as well. So these are very, very rare situations um, that need to be diagnosed through blood work and through specialists and so forth. So um, can they be helped with chiropractic? Yes, but you're not treating those specific uh, conditions. You're basically always correcting the alignment and structure of the spine and reducing um, the, um, the, uh, the structural distortions and improving the overall quality of life and mobility and structure of the spine, okay, through chiropractic. Okay. So, um, contrarian thinker, should we get a shot for the bulge? I'm assuming you're talking about um, cortisone shot or some kind of uh, pain reliever shot, and I cannot answer that question for you. Um, that's something that needs to be discussed between you and your uh, medical doctor. Uh, chiropractors don't deal with medicines. Um, I've had many patients tell me that uh, sometimes they help, sometimes they don't. So I just don't know. That's something you need to investigate with your medical doctor. Um, I always like to advocate for a conservative, non-surgical, non-drug approach uh, if possible. Of course, surgery last resort. Sometimes people do use medications and drugs for uh, concurrent or co-management um, things. But um, I like to pr proceed with uh, um, non-conservative methods. So do discuss that with your family family doctor or medical doctor. Okay, we have Akuno. Uh, hi, Dr. Walter. I'm in a lot of pain due to disc herniation. Since I'm in Brampton and don't drive, I'll appreciate it if you can refer to any good chiropractor over there. So Akuno, if you are still on, uh, this live chat box may disappear after, so I may not see it. So um, I will put on the comment section my website and you'll see the... Um, the um, email address to our office and you shoot me an email and just mention you were on the video and I will uh, refer you to a chiropractor out in Brampton that I know personally. We cross refer all the time. She's really great and she'll take care of you. Okay, so I'll put my uh, contact information here, my website. And I've referred many people to this doctor in Brampton. So you uh, let me know if you want uh, that. You can reach out to me specifically for that, okay? All right. Um, let me see. Let me see here. Okay, Kunal. Again, I absolutely like the information you delivered. Highly appreciate it. I thank you for the feedback. I thrive on that, and I'll keep doing more and more of this for all of you. Pradeep, I heard about calcium floor and calcium phosphate salts cure lumbar. I'm not familiar with that. I stick to I stick to what I know best, which is structural correction of the spine and posture. And um, if there's other things that are required, they need to be investigated with other professionals that work with that primarily. But I, I focus on one thing and one thing only, structural assessment and correction of the spine. That is what I've seen in 20 years that have helped many, many people get their life back if they've had a spinal problem, okay? So um, it might, I just don't know, you need to look at that, look into, your, into yourself, it's just not part of my expertise. 
Okay, Kuno, I would love to meet you, but at the moment, not in good shape to travel. I totally understand. We talked about how to find a referral for you and uh, just reach out to me um, through our email and I'll send you a referral, no problem. Pranip, again, happy new year to you as well and your family. We have Arab Khan. Hi, doctor. Uh, I'm right to you from Turkey. Awesome. Welcome from Turkey. Appreciate it. I have a problem in L405, about three months. Right leg is, is hot, I'm assuming. What do you think? Can I get better? With, um, and I appreciate it. So, again, I, I, I talk about this over and over again. A proper assessment of the spine is required. Physical assessment, range of motion, spinal function assessment, checking for misalignments, segmental misalignments, leg length analysis, um, walking balance tests. Uh, I think I mentioned posture already. Um, some orthopedic tests may be required in some cases, neurologic testing and an x-ray analysis of the alignment of the spine. Uh, these are all necessary to make a diagnosis. So um, it's I can offer very, very little input um, without having the full clinical picture. But if you're getting, uh, if you're looking for um, um, some kind of guidance, those are the things that you should be assessed for. And then once you discover if there is a structural disruption of the spine that could be triggering these problems, especially in the right leg and so forth, then you need to begin to pro uh, get corrective um, corrections to the spine through some type of chiropractic methodologies to help correct the spine. So I'm not familiar with uh, the presence of chiropractic in Turkey. I hope there's some out there, but uh, definitely look into that and uh, hopefully we'll guide you in the right direction. Spinal stenosis, Pradeep um, asked spinal stenosis. And I love all your questions, Pradeep, appreciate it. So there's two types of stenosis that I wanna mention. And one is central canal stenosis. So we talked about this earlier. So here's the central canal of the spine and there should be a, a um, kind of a wide opening of that canal. And when that canal narrows, it causes stenosis. Anywhere from L2 and above can impinge the spinal cord. It's very, very serious. Below L2 where the cauti quina is, so in the lower area, there can be stenosis in there and that can impinge the cauti quina nerves, which can cause serious neurologic compromise to the pelvic organs, the um, like the sex glands, the bladder, uh, or the abdominal organs, uh, like the colon, uh, lower, lower intestinal system, the, bo the bowels. So that's when there's serious, serious compromise or spinal stenosis. So what, what spinal stenosis? So sometimes there's a buildup of bone at, around the spinal canal. Sometimes uh, there's degeneration that accumulates in there. Sometimes there's disc bulges that can cause stenosis. Or when there's, um, so over here, when the spine should be normal elliptical shape, but when it's losing its alignment, it causes a buckling of the ligament of flavum on the inside. You may have heard that on your, on your uh, MRI report. That buckling can actually, right inside, it's hard for you to see that, but that buckling of that ligament of flavum on the inside, that can actually uh, narrow the spinal canal as well. So um, adjustments, chiropractic adjustments are important. Exercises are important as well to help. Kunal, thank you, Dr. Walter, and I appreciate that. Uh, again, Kunal, what, the, uh, what does or is the differentiation between disc herniation pain versus severe muscular pain? Very, very good question. I love this question. Okay, so what's the differentiate? How can you differentiate between a disc herniation pain and, and muscular pain? So typically when there's, when there's a disc herniation or disc bulge pain, it's, it's a very, very um, acute um, serious, severe pain, and I can literally put, put my finger into the L, L5-S1 area, L4-L5 area, right down the center, point to that, and the patient's jumping off the table. And that's a very, very strong indication there could be a disc bulge. It's not definitive diagnosis, but very, very strong, strong indication. Clinically, when someone begins to have symptoms in the legs, like lateral leg pain or numbing in the foot, these are uh, or numbing in the thigh area, these are also clinical signs that there can be disc, uh, disc problems as well, okay? Muscular, um, muscular pain, when I begin to um, palpate the muscles along the spine, they're more superficial on the lateral aspect or on the glutes, and I press on there, then that's, and people are triggering or jump because of that, then that is more of a muscular problem, okay? So through palpation and through various tests, we can, and, and also through clinical presentations, we can figure this out. Now, I also want to mention um, that muscular pain versus spinal problems. Muscular conditions or muscular disruptions or muscular pain or muscular spasms 
are usually and almost always secondary to spinal disruption, okay? To spinal disruption. And why is because neurologically, the nerves control the muscles, the spine protects the nerves, it's a neural spinal organ that feeds information to the brain. If there's a disruption here, it will automatically affect the tendons and muscles along the spine and the muscles have to react secondarily to the spinal disruption. So if you're targeting only muscular therapy through physio or massage, nothing inherently wrong with those, they're great. I use them as co-management co options for our patients. But if you're doing that only with those structural correction of the spine, you're not gonna get very good results. Um, I always like to reserve those later on, muscular work later on. We wanna improve the structural alignment of the spine first, the functionality of the spine first, and then work on the muscles later on, okay? So that's very, very important. What can help degenerative disc disease? So DDD, this is a lane. So let's back up again, okay? So very, very important, okay, good question. So I like to use my models, and if you like, if you like these models, give me a thumbs up if you find them helpful, okay? So give me a thumbs up, let me know if you find these models helpful. So over here, healthy disc, okay, healthy disc over here, degenerative disc. This is degenerative disc disease, DDD. This is very, very severe, okay? This is a severe one, okay? So they're, they're literally almost touching together, okay? It doesn't always start like this. It starts with, do I have another one here? No, I have it at my office. So um, this is normal. When it begins to narrow down its early signs of degenerative disc disease, okay? So we catch it on an MRI or we catch it on an X-ray. Okay, x-ray, we see a narrowing down of the disc space, early signs of degenerative disc disease, okay? So, what can help? So, first of all, number one, we need to ask, why is this here? What caused this? This, this? this does not just show up in someone's spine. And it's not age-related either. Like, I have patients that come in, they're like 55 years old, <clears throat> they'll have degenerative disc disease at L L5, the degenerative disc disease at L4, but L3, L2, and L1 are good. L, L1, L2, L3 are still 55 years old. L4, L5 are still 55 years old, but these are disrupted, okay? So it's not age-related. So there had to be some kind of trauma, either impact or micro trauma or disruption over time that caused that, okay? So in order to, you can't go back and reverse and correct, you can't go back and reverse this. Once the damage is done, it's done, okay? So you're not gonna change something that's irreversible in terms of permanent damage. But if there's a disruption on the spine that's triggering that damage on the disc, then can you begin to correct the alignment? As long as it's not too advanced the problem and we caught it early enough, then yes. The goal is to improve the alignment. Or if someone has, you know, again, this is normal, okay, elliptical is normal, and they've lost the curve in the spine, that will cause this degeneration over here and over here and over here, okay? So we want to improve the alignment and relieve the strain, the abnormal strain on that disc, okay? And that will improve the, the progression of worsening of that degenerative disc problem. So chiropractic adjustments are super important to do that in terms of helping. Number two, uh, mobility work. I talked about that earlier in my three steps in this video earlier. So uh, pelvic tilt and um, I was very, very helpful. And of course, keeping mobility um, and flexibility such as the stretching. So chiropractic adjustments, mobility, flexibility, stretching, and then that balance work that I talked about. Very, very key components, okay? But it all starts with structural correction of the spine. So you're not gonna go back and, and change permanent damage, but you wanna prevent it from progressing in the future, and you may not prevent it 100%, let's be realistic, but at least you're slowing down the, the advanced progression, okay? Cool, awesome. All right, let's see what we have here. And I'll keep going, uh, right, right now we're 73 minutes into this live broadcast and I'm having a blast. If you're having a blast, give me some thumbs up. I'm excited about this. Let me know if you're excited about this. And if you find value in this, let me know, because I'll keep doing this over and over again, okay? Let's see, let's see, let's see, what do we got here? Happy New Year again to all of you that are saying Happy New Year. It's 2020. It's the beginning of a new year and a new decade. Let's make this the best year ever, man, from going forward, from this point forward. Okay, Al Kareem. Can hip issues cause sitting pain between where the butt and hamstring meet? My hip shows normal on x-rays. By the way, as well, all hip tests came out negative as well as my lumbar movement uh, tests. 
Al, I love your question. I can't tell you how common I get this question asked, and I can't tell you how, how often it's mishandled when it comes to this symptomatology, this hip pain symptomatology. So I'm really happy to address this. Okay, hip pain. The first thing that I ask someone is, show me where the hip pain is, okay? So I have to stand, no, I can't stand. So uh, there's too many things around here. So if someone is pointing to the lateral aspect where the hip joint is, that to me indicates that's where the hip pain is coming from. And I need, I need to investigate the hip joint. But oftentimes when I ask where is it, so oh, I'll show you my model, okay? So say, say, I'll say point to the hip pain, okay? So here's the front and the back of here. They'll say over here, the lateral aspect. Well, I will investigate now the hip joint, okay? The actual ball and socket joint of the hip, okay? If they say, where's the hip pain? Point to it, and they'll point now in the back over here. Most people call this the hip when it comes to pain because they think this is the general hip area, over here, the general hip area, but this is not the hip. This is called the sacral iliac joint, okay? Sacral iliac joint. And if you go to the doctor and you say hip pain, guess what? They're gonna send you for hip x-rays, they're gonna send you for hip MRIs, they're gonna send you for hip ultrasounds, and if there's no problem with the hip joint, the hip x-ray comes out normal, just like what you've had. Tell me if that's not true, okay? That's that's uh, Al, right? So if someone is sitting and they're feeling pain, so look, he, he actually indicates where the problem is. So sitting pain between where the butt and the hamstring meets. So somewhere around here, okay? because the hamstrings meet over here. So I start to think, let me investigate the sacral iliac joint. Sacrum, where's my pointer? Sacrum, pelvis. Ilium of the pelvis, sacrum. Over here, sacral iliac joint. There's one on both sides. Okay, now, let me show you on my bigger model. I don't have the pelvis here, but here's the sacrum. So over here is part of the sacral iliac joint. So you just need the pelvis over here. When someone is sitting, the sacral iliac joint, the SI joints, get disrupted and irritated. So now you're sitting and they get disrupted and irritated. They squeeze in over here. And if there's a, a, a structural distortion or biomechanical distortion in how the sacrum is, is moving, and the sacrum moves in different axes of rotation, which we assess for in our office as well, if there's a disruption, it can cause chronic inflammation and it can be a pain generator. And I can literally point and press on that sacral iliac area or the bony prominence here in the tissue in that area. People begin to jump and light up and tell you that that could be a sacral iliac joint problem. Then we apply corrective chiropractic adjustments to correct that and adjust it after we test it out. And then people tell me that they, they improve because of that. So that's something that needs to be investigated. So check with a chiropractor, uh, tell them your symptomatology, show them your tests so they can rule out those things, and then have them investigate the sacral iliac joint and the lower back alignment. Hope that uh, you found that useful. Anyone that complains about hip pain, very, very important distinction there. Okay, Yumish, does back brace help in posterior disc bulge case? Wow, I can't tell you how often I get the, the back brace question. I had it asked today by a family member of all things, a family member. Uh, he asked, um, he's having some disc issues I'm helping him with, and he goes, I wanna go to the gym and work out. Should I use a back belt? And the, and the answer is no, okay? Don't use a back belt. Um, years ago, um, the idea was that if you're using a belt to contain the uh, lumbar, the um, abdominal area and the lumbar spine in the back, that it helps, uh, helps apply stabilization. Unfortunately, the research, um, what the research is showing, not unfortunate with the research, but unfortunately, uh, the usage, the usage of back belts is that it weakens the, the coordination mus muscles that I talked about earlier that we want to retrain, and it, it gives people a false sense of security that the belt is holding them in place properly. But meanwhile, their true core muscles that should keep them stabilized they're not activated, they're never getting uh, engaged, and they're not getting strengthened, and therefore can you can be susceptible to more re-injury, okay? So I don't recommend back belts at all, at all, zero, okay? All right, what do we have here? We have, um, okay, Sharmila, Sharmila in India, thank you for coming. So which option is better for el elderly people since my mother's having disc degeneration problems, she is 65 years old, can physiotherapy help um, okay, physiotherapy helps. So, first of all, 65 years old is not old. Come on, all right? But I know what you're saying. She's older than you, and I get that. So, I've helped many, many people in that age category of 65 to 75 to even 80. And 
I truly believe that they can actually do really well under conservative care, such as chiropractic and even physio, okay? Um, physio should still look at the structural integrity of the spine, work on mobility and, um, um, and functionality, uh, improvement of the spine. I'm not sure if physiotherapists in India actually adjust the spine in some other, some parts of the world they do. But um, in my opinion, the elite when it comes to correction of the spine are chiropractors. So if you can find a chiropractic area to look at that, that, will, that may be something that can help your mom, okay? So um, even though there's disc degeneration at this age of 65, people at this age can still recover from conservative care such as chiropractic and also physios as well or using them both together for sure, okay? Okay, we have Kunul again. After having a disc herniation, the pain gone uh, gone very less. Then after sneezing and sitting position, restart the pain again. Does that mean the disc got herniated? Okay, so good question. So um, there was a disc herniation she's saying and she's improved and then sneezed and then the pain triggered, okay? So um, does that mean that this, uh, did the disc get re-herniated? First of all, I don't know if it got re-herniated because uh, you know, I don't have any images and I don't have any assessments, but just generally speaking, and we talked about this earlier as well, um, is that when there is a disc bulge, right? So, so there's this bulge right there, okay? When there's a disc bulge, that even though you're improving with your symptoms and your function and your mobility and your flexibility and your quality of life is back and there's no pain and you're doing things all over again, that disc bulge may still be there even without symptoms. So now, if when you sneeze, you're creating a tremendous amount of forces intra-abdominally. So it's intra-abdominal pressure that's created and that may disrupt that injured disc that's already there. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's got re-herniated all over again or got more herniated. That's not necessarily true. I, I can't rule that out whatsoever, obviously, in your particular case, but it does mean that it could re-injure it or inflame it and cause you to cause symptoms over again, uh, re reproduce symptoms over again. So um, in which case, what I think is that you, you need to look at the spine and look at getting it properly assessed and getting it properly stabilized, like I talked about earlier. And that's why these re-injuries occur because the spine never got corrected. Uh, flexibility is probably still very poor. Mobility is also very poor. And then there's um, the lack of, of core strengthening and then also st stability with the joint um, receptors. So those are important things to look at to prevent re-injury on the spine. Okay, cool. Cool. All right, I'm gonna keep going. There's a few more over here and we're already 81 minutes into this live. We did have a disruption earlier, but we got through it. So I'm, I'm happy about that. And I'm happy that you guys are all back on. So we have here, okay, um, Sharmila, she asks again, she goes, continuation of the above question, can you suggest which is better option, physiotherapy or surgery? Very, very good question. Um, I cannot give a specific answer, unfortunately, Sharmila, and I hope you can appreciate that because I haven't really met you, I haven't assessed you, I don't have your uh, examination findings, I don't know what your x-rays look like and your MRI reports look like, and many people, you know, send them to me. I cannot, I cannot do remote uh, consultations. So I don't know what the best option is for you right now. I can give some generalities. In my, in my opinion, surgery should always be the last resort. After all conservative options have failed, for whatever reason, at least give them a shot. Surgery. Surgery is the most invasive intervention. You're cutting the tissues, you're cutting the spine, you're getting through bone, and there's healing through the surgical procedure. There's rehabilitations required afterwards. It may not even correct the underlying problem or the pain can reoccur in the future. So there's a lot of risks with that, not just later, but also during the surgery. High, high risk intervention. So if it can be the last thing that, that's on the table as an option, that's what I will leave it there. But do, do at least investigate conservative options and such as chiropractic and physiotherapy. So um, I don't know um, if you require surgical consultation or not. Obviously, I cannot know that through this video medium here but that's something that needs to be discussed with your primary doctor because they'll certainly direct you in the right direction, okay? And if not, check with a chiropractor or physiotherapist in your area and see what they tell you because if it's something that's not they cannot handle, they'll let you know, okay? I'm sure they will. All right, all right, all right. Okay, so uh, Peritosh, 
we have, I have a L5S1 disc bulge. What should I do? My, my, my. I think I've answered that over and over again. I think the best thing is to uh, start back at the beginning of this video. And um, I, I, there's a lot of tidbits of information that I talked about. If you guys agree with me that I've been on for a while, let me know if that's true. Um, but there is a lot of information on how to address an L5S1 disc bulge. Also have a ton of, a ton of videos on my channel the, um, devoted strictly to that topic. So make sure you look at that as well. Okay. Surgit, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, last minute, I have L5S1, this problem. I'm with you. Uh, I have a lot of information on my uh, channel in terms of my uh, other videos that address that in terms of what causes it, how to correct, uh, how to correct the underlying problem, how to look for the underlying problem, and then some exercises that you can do. And a lot of information on this current video earlier in the earlier part of the video, we'll talk about that as well, okay? So make sure you look at that, Laxman. Okay, so Pradeep, uh, what causes disc issues in the first place? And I've addressed that again over and over again, but I'll that again, I'll address it again. So in my opinion, what I've seen is um, structural, um, chronic structural distortions of spinal alignment that create abnormal loads and strains on disc tissues are probably the most common reason for disc degeneration or disc injuries, okay? So what does that mean? This is a lumbar spine, low back. Your entire body weight is on your lumbar spine and on your sacrum. The lumbar spine should be straight from the front and have an elliptical curve from the side. We talk about this over and over again, okay? That's normal ideal alignment. The actual structures of the spine are designed to take the load on the posterior aspect, the back part of the spine, okay? I believe it's 75% of the body's weight or the load is on the posterior aspect. They're very, very strong areas of the spine that take the weight. 25% should be on the front. Where are the discs? The discs are on the front, the anterior aspect, not the back. So if there's a misalignment of the spine in this fashion, now the load is on the front, right? And the discs are not designed to take a load on the front. And if that becomes a chronic problem over the span of 5, 10, 15, 20 years, over time, because of the wear and tear of that abnormal strain and, 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 and stresses on the disc tissues, the effects of gravity, uh, our entire posture being distorted over that can cause wear and tear over time, cause annular tears on the inside and eventually disc bulges. So it's kind of a general description of what causes disc, disc degeneration or disc bulging. Um, and of course, it could be a traumatic event Obviously, I, I just think that this uh, ongoing degenerative process over many years uh, is, is one of the most common reasons. And that's why it's important to assess the structural balance and integrity of the spine and get it corrected. And one of the best ways is through corrective chiropractic care. Hope that answers your question, Freddie. If it did, let me know, okay? Okay, we've got some more questions coming through. All right, we have Oscar Gonzalez. And uh, we have, what about for L5 subluxation? Okay, so... L5. Okay, here we have L5, okay, L4, the joints on the back, L5, okay? So the spine should be, have mobility, the spine should have proper alignment. When it's out of position and stuck out of position, so it's distorted, it could be global or segmental, that's called vertebral subluxation. Right? So if it's more than one area, it's global. If it's one area, it's, it's a segmental or local subluxations. And the best way to correct that is through uh, structural corrections or chiropractic adjustments. We adjust L5 all day long. We adjust sacrums all day long. L5 is all, all day long. They're the most common areas in the lumbar spine, the low back area that gets subluxated or misaligned. Chiropractic is, is probably the best thing you can do for that. Definitely look into that. Okay. We have uh, Umesh, what should I do to relieve the pain in case of posterior bulge uh, case? Right now, I, I'm not able to walk and stand and feel severe pain when I, I try to do so. Okay, so um, again, it's been answered over and over again, but I'll just kind of briefly mention. First of all, need a proper assessment of the spine, check for alignment problems, postural problems, mobility restrictions, and then work on correcting the structural alignment of the spine if it's out of position through some kind of corrective chiropractic methods or corrections. Um, sometimes physiotherapy can help and then work on flexibility, mobility, core strengthening later on, and then balance exercises. So kind of a, kind of a synopsis of what this entire uh, show and video is about today. Okay. 
Okay, so I have L3 pain, but I don't hear much about how to treat that. That's sweet cakes, and um, that's a good that's a good um, uh, a point there, sweet cakes, because if we look at the spine here, most common problems are going to be with the sacrum, so sacroiliac area, the L5 and, and L4, and I see that all the time in my office. Sometimes L3. So again, if there's an L3 um, subluxation or misalignment or distortion chiropractic adjustments have helped that over and over and over again. So getting some chiropractic corrections on the spine, postural corrections can help. These things are very important, something to look into as well. So the same concept applies to all areas of the spine. I just talk a lot about L4 and L5, L5 and S1, because it is the most common area to be degenerated in the lower back, but the other areas of the spines can be affected as well. Okay, I do see that often. Okay, thanks so much, doctor. That's from Oscar, I appreciate that. Okay, what else do we have here? I might have a, a Wi-Fi problem. There we go, we're back on, okay. Never know with live video, okay? We're 89 minutes into this and I, I'm loving it. So uh, I think I'm gonna wrap this up soon. Uh, sweet Cakes, I appreciate the feedback there. So um, I'm just gonna be on for like another, let's say another uh, two to four, two to three minutes. If, uh, if you're um, um, having last minute questions, let me know, otherwise I'm gonna wrap this up and I can tell you a ton of ton of information has been given uh, in this video right now. It's an hour and a half into it. Um, so if you found this valuable, let me know in, in the chat box and in the comments below. If you found this useful, let me know as well. If you um, 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 have any other questions, let me know as well. Do my best to, to guide you along, okay? Um, Pradeep, one last question. And thanks for being with us, Pradeep, all, all night long. I really appreciate it. I can tell you're very, very... Uh, devoted to um, finding answers for yourself and, and I'm just happy to be a part of that and I'm hoping that it helps you, okay? So one last question, if the pain is going to the toe, which lumbar is affected, L4, L5, or sacral? So oftentimes it's gonna be an L5, um, L5 um, um, nerve that goes right to the toes. L4 will um, not typically go to the toes, be more around the leg and foot area. So most likely it's gonna be L5 um, and maybe even S1, okay? So that needs to be looked at. Um, Thomas James, I have numbness after surgery in the leg. I feel I feel for you. You know, um, I just had a discussion today as well. Another, this is a, uh, I mentioned earlier a family friend, uh, but this is an actual um, uh, neighbor of of, um, of of ours, and he had a disc problem years ago and had discectomy or disc surgery to remove it. And he's doing better today. Like he's walking normally. He has a pretty much normal quality of life, but he still has residual numbness in the toe. So sometimes the surgery will do what it needs to do for that immediate urgent correction, but there may be some residual symptoms later on. And uh, you know you have to kind of weigh uh, your your pros and your cons, right? Your risks and your benefits. Um, you have to ask yourself: Can I live with this little bit of numbness in the toe if I if I did? if I resolve the, the serious back pain that I had before, the serious leg pain that I had before through surgery. So we kind of look at the benefits of that, right? It's very, very important. Um, okay, what do we have here? I think that's good. So if you guys enjoyed this, let me know. Uh, say yes in the comment section or give me some thumbs up. Do click on that blue thumb uh, as well on the um, under the video because uh, you know YouTube likes to know um, um, likes the signals of of comments so comment below as well and the signals of thumbs up if you like this stuff because um, if if you like it YouTube will suggest it more to other people that need this information okay so please let me know not just in the chat box but also in the comment section below if you do leave comments after the live video I do my best to answer them. I literally get thousands of comments, I'm not kidding. So I try to answer them as best as I can. Uh, and if I can refer you to another video, I'll do that as well. As well, if you catch this later on uh, and you're not a subscriber to this channel, do subscribe so you don't miss out on notifications. Click the notification bell so you do catch this again um, as these things happen, okay? So I hope you appreciate that and share this with your family and friends, plug it into your playlist and then text it and message it to your family and friends that need this information, very, very important. Uh, one last question I want I want to take here, Kunal. And I'm going to wrap this up. Once we have MRI showing disc herniation, it will not be better if we go now for MRI two years down the line. So if you have a recurrent back episode, how do you conclude it is a disc issue or muscular issue? Very very good question. So you need to uh, determine that through a clinical examination and a clinical assessment of your overall condition. 
So I don't just base it. I don't just base um, my diagnosis on someone's MRI. The MRI will tell me the structural issues of the spine, the soft tissue structural issues and the bony structural issues. Then I take my x-rays for alignment um, position. I do postural assessment and I do other tests and I listen to the overall person's clinical history. And I put it all together through all my assessments, the results and all the um, special imaging. Then I determine, well, is it caused from this, this bulge or is it caused from a joint issue? Is it posture? Is it alignment? Is it muscle? So it's a very good question. Uh, it's done through a, cl a clinical assessment, history, clinical assessment, and also through uh, imaging as well. Okay. Hope that answered your question, Kunal. So again, thanks for coming on all. We did 94 minutes together. I appreciate you all. Happy New Year 2020. Make it the best year ever. And then come back to this channel for more information. I will put more videos out for exercises. I'm going to put the balance one out pretty soon. I talked about that earlier. And then we'll do more lives. If you want more lives, let me know in the comments below and let me know in the chat box. But more in the comments below. Dr. Walter here, signing out. Love you all. Take care.